Hello and welcome to this, the opening keynote of SOX 2020. My name is Daniel Harabor and together with Mara Valati, I'm one of the co-chairs of the conference. Now, as you may be aware, this year's SOX has a special theme, looking at the connections between heuristic and combinatorial search on the one hand and the screen optimization on the other hand. A distinguished speaker today has a long history of working at the interface of these two areas. And indeed, she's given us many of the ideas and techniques that we regard as foundational. I'm speaking, of course, about Professor Rena Dechter, who comes to us from the University of California at Irvine. Now, Rena is a very decorated member of our community, and she has many laurels to her name. I'm not going to attempt to list them all because I couldn't possibly do her justice. But let me tell you about just some of her many achievements. So she's a fellow of the AAAI. She's a fellow of the ACM. She's a former fellow of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She's the winner of the CP Research Excellence Award, and she's the co-author of many successful and prize-winning algorithms. Now, before we get to her talk, I wanna speak a little bit about the impact that Rena's work has had on our community. And while there are many examples that I could talk about, I've selected two which are particularly close to my own heart. Now, working in the area of heuristic search, Rena developed the theoretical tools and indeed even the terminology that allowed us to um, analyze and discuss and understand really for the first time, I think, the efficiency of cornerstone algorithms such as ASAR. This is an outstanding piece of work, which I think really set the tone for subsequent research in the area. Another area where Rena's work has had tremendous um, impact is backtracking search. So here she gave us um, techniques such as efficient back jumping, no good learning, and bucket elimination. These are wonderfully inspiring ideas, and you can find them today at the heart of modern solvers for discrete optimization. In today's lecture, Rena continues uh, telling us about the interface of these two different areas, and she's going to talk to us about how variable-based inference methods, which are the core problem-solving technique in discrete optimization can be used to strengthen and enhance heuristic state-space search. It's a wonderful lecture and I hope you enjoy it. Hi everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here uh, to give my first recorded uh, invited talk. Um, I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizer, Daniel and uh, Marwa for inviting me for SOX. Uh, indeed, when I uh, uh, accepted the invitation, I had in mind being in Vienna and enjoying the beautiful city, and I'm sure you, are, you all hoped for that. But I think uh, we, life is what it is, and we are quite likely to do, still have this alternative environment where we can continue our business. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, in general, my plan is to share with you the work in my group uh, in the past decade in probabilistic reasoning, focusing uh, on bringing principles of reasoning from different uh, disciplines, including statistics, complex analysis, and most of all, heuristic search. Uh, so it, my talk will have, a, in part, a tutorial, a tutorial flavor to it. I normally say you can ask questions when you want, but in this case you cannot, but you, can, you will be able to ask questions at the end. So why my slides are not moving? Hmm. Okay, it does move. So uh, let me uh, start with uh, when the work that I'm doing uh, is uh, in uh, reasoning and problem solving in AI. And central aspect is modeling. We cannot uh, do reasoning in artificial intelligence. We cannot capture uh, reason about the world if don't, we don't have models about the world. And I would like to make a, a simple uh, observation regarding models in AI. There are uh, two types of models that we see in artificial intelligence. State-based models, uh, the models that are based on states, like in planning, for example, they uh, manifest in search spaces that we uh, solve the planning task or the task that we have at, uh, in, at our hand, and model based on variables such as constraint networks, Bayesian networks, Markov networks, 
and so on. Now, state-based models are more general. Let me just start my timer, which I forgot to do. Uh, uh, state-based models are more, are more general. They can model pretty much anything in uh, any problem in any domain. Uh, while variable-based models uh, have more structure, they capture more information, and, and in nature they are less general, even though you can move from one presentation to the other, as I will describe. In search, uh, search was always considered for variable-based models, uh, for example, backtracking, uh, search for constraint satisfaction, integer programming, search for most probable explanation in the early days of Bayesian networks. But what I would like to show you here, how we can take search a um, few steps further and to bring together methods that are based on state space models and variable based models uh, to advance uh, problem solving and reasoning. Um, so this is basically uh, the picture that I would like to share with you. In general, in, in uh, variable-based models, we uh, we also have a graph associated with the graph that describes the domain, and uh, it facilitates what we know or call as message passing methods or variational methods that operates directly on the graph or on the collection of variables and functions that we have in the graphical models. In search, we are working on the states. This is the picture that we have here. And what I will show you that even in search we can capture structure and primarily the idea of or the methodology of all the work that we show you here is that we can combine this a, a very nice way of bridging or uh, collaborating between these two paradigms is using uh, variable based me methods such as inference to produce heuristic to guide search in an effective way. And all of this is under the realization that we are solving uh, hard problems and we cannot solve them often, we cannot solve them exactly. So the, uh, the desire is to, pro to generate anytime algorithms that uh, pro produce bounds that get tighter and, tight and tighter as uh, we have more resource resources to solve the problem. And when search and inference are limited, even in the, their ability to collaborate, we can always go and replace or uh, assist search with sampling by just traversing portion of it and harness statistics. So this is uh, the, uh, the plan that I have for this talk. I will start with uh, a background of graphical models and we'll focus on one task in particular that is called marginal map that capture that, uh, as I will show, is uh, general enough to capture the variety of uh, tasks that we have in graphical model and it's the most challenging but yet the most uh, important one. I will give some background on variable based methods like exact, exact inference, then move to how search can be conducted uh, on uh, for graphical models, state space search using the notion of end or search spaces. Then we'll discuss how variational bounds uh, can be used to, uh, to guide heuristic search. And finally, I will illustrate this uh, by combining the methods for the task of marginal maps and at the end move to sampling and conclude. And these three uh, the elements that I have here uh, illustrated are the, build, the building blocks that I'm going to really use uh, in all this methodology, namely variational methods that feed to search and feed into sampling and also uh, we can have collaboration between sampling and searching. <coughs> So, um, graphical models are everywhere. Uh, here we have, we see directed graphical models uh, such as Bayesian network that are uh, often used for diagnosis. And uh, we also have uh, Boltzmann or Markov networks like Boltzmann machine used for character recognitions. 
They can be used in languages, um, Markov logic, like Markov logic and probabilistic languages that use higher level constants, relational constants. And uh, also we have here influence diagram. We want to capture the ability of making the sequential decision under uncertainty using this model. It can be translated to, translated to Markov decision processes and point DPs and MDPs. And Graphical models are, can also be used, uh, uh, can be learned, and also uh, when there are um, an essential part in uh, current learning methods, uh, we have autoregressive, uh, uh, generative autoregressive models that are essentially, uh, I learned recently, Bayesian networks when the function are neural networks. And we also have the, the neural network, which is also a graphical model in a sense, uh, it's a graph, and it has functions. Uh, the, the difference in thinking is that uh, the neural network normally solves a single problem, so it, it encapsulates both the model and the task, and there is a single task. Well, when we are talking about models, normally we think about uh, knowledge represented independent, independent of the queries, and we can ask a variety of queries over the model. Uh, one of the earliest uh, model and the most famous one is a, ba a Bayesian network. It's very important. This is a, an example for one of the earliest uh, applications in medical diagnosis. Uh, what you see here, uh, a, a directed graph depicting uh, uh, propositions such as smoke, smoking, lung cancer, bronchitis, and symptoms such as dysphenia, which is short, shortness of breath in case you don't know, and some tests that can be performed. And the directed graph represent causal or uh, a, 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 a close relationship between cause and effect between, uh, between uh, the different variables. And we quantify these uh, uh, relationships by conditional probability tables between or, or functions between every child and its parents. And uh, once we have this uh, conditional probabilities associated with every variable, we it, it represent a joint probability distribution over the domain. And now we have a knowledge about the domain and we can ask any query. In particular, it's common to ask uh, um, belief or uh, conditional probability queries given evidence what is the uh, updated uh, belief that a person has lung cancer if you learn that he uh, didn't smoke and doesn't have shortness, uh, but does have shortness of breath. So this is um, a belief network, or also called a summation network uh, query. Uh, and we can also often want to find the most likely scenario or the most likely uh, assignment to all the variables. This is called most probable explanation or map query. And overall, we the queries that uh, the that we are able to express over Bayesian networks involve prediction, diagnosis, classification, and decision making. So this is uh, one of the uh, most famous uh, graphical models, probabilistic graphical models. But in general, graphical graphical models uh, for a framework is very general. It involves a collection of variables, domains that can be discrete or continuous. I would assume in this talk that the domains are discrete, and then a collection of functions. The functions are defined on small subsets of variables called their scopes, and we can express a, a, an objective function or function of interest by combining those functions by various operators like summation, product, join. Typically, if we are talking about probability distribution, we will uh, we will. Uh, use the product. If we talk about relation, it will be join, summations, or some other combinatorial optimization task of interest. And then, once we have this global function, we can answer the, ask queries, and for, mathematically, this can be expressed by other elimination operators that are depicted here. And uh, we can ask all these queries expressed by these two operators, for example, the map query, the pure optimization by uh, max and product, some inference, what I showed before, this is probability of evidence, uh, posterior probability, or 
what is known as partition function is this by summation and what we are focusing this day on mixed inference when we have some uh, uh, a application of summation and some of maximization to capture uh, task of interests. And the function that behind all these models, there is an abstraction that is the graph. So we associate a primal graph with every graphical model when the nodes are variables and there uh, we connect any two nodes if they participate in the scope of a single function as illustrated here. The functions themselves, depending on the domain, can be either clauses, if it's constraints, conditional probabilities, or relations. Everything is very hard to solve. It's getting harder and harder as we move from uh, a, a optimization to summation to mixed queries. And therefore, it's essential to really um, compromise and work for finding an anytime solution and to try and get some bounds on the results. Bounds that will be tightened with time, as I said earlier. So why, again, why marginal map? Um, because uh, often we have a very big model and we are interested in predicting only a subset of the variables. So we want to marginalize or to sum over the variables that we are not interested in to get the view over the ones that we do and then optimize. And uh, uh, some examples that are uh, typical is um, planning, uh, planning un under uncertainty, decision making. We want to compute the maximum expected utility, the, the set of actions that will give us the maximum expected utility. In, namely, we need to sum over random variables and to maximize over decision variables, as an example. This is uh, the most challenging task, and it can be even half on this very nice structure that we are familiar with, which is our trees. Another very uh, important application is computational um, protein design. In this class, uh, we are interested in a configuration that compromises, that, uh, that optimizes over a cost or reward function. So in this set, uh, uh, comput uh, uh, computational protein design, the task is often to determine a configuration of amino acid that maximizes the likelihood of a particular protein structure. Uh, so the, the likelihood is largely based on energy that interact uh, of interaction between the amino acids. So here you have uh, these amino acids that are on the on the structure on the three-dimensional uh, structure that is part of the input, and they, this, there are side chains that are also interacting. That are, uh, side chains are associated with the amino acids that are selected in the configuration. Thus, we need to take into account not only the possible amino acid configuration, but also the, the different conformation that their side chain, side chain can take. So. Uh, we can formulate it, we can have, uh, uh, we can assume that the side chains will take uh, their optimal value, and this is a static formulation that will uh, require, that will allow modeling this uh, uh, problem of uh, computational uh, protein design as a pure optimization. We optimize both over the side chain and the uh, amino acid that are assigned. Uh, another more realistic formulation that uh, we are currently working on is, can will be translated to the marginal map task. In that formulation, um, uh, in that formulation, to cap we want to capture the fact that the uh, the side chain are uh, dynamic; they are not staying in a single uh, location, and they move all the time. And in order to capture that, uh, we can. Uh, compute the entropy or summation over the conformation uh, and then maximize over the uh, assigned amino acid. So in that case, the maximization we had before is replaced with summation and we formally have a marginal map task. And this is actually a current task that we are uh, highly involved in. So to summarize overall, uh, we have many tasks of graphical models and are listed here. I mentioned 
those and the uh, maximum expected utility explicitly noted here is another mixed uh, sum uh, max task. There is the constraint satisfaction, this, which is for us the simplest tax. And uh, recently we worked on the tax that is another mixture to compute the number of optimal solutions. So it's another twist on the same, uh, on, on this variety of queries. And the pleasant and the nice thing about a uh, graphical model uh, is the uniformity, the ability to show that certain type of algorithm, which I will shortly talk about, verbal elimination, can address all of these problems and we have an understanding of when they are not uh, applicable and when they are. So this brings me now to the uh, next part where I will talk about the specific um, methods that are more natural for the, graph for the variable based models or graphical models, which are inference and message passing. And the most uh, a well-known algorithm is variable elimination. Here uh, we call it bucket elimination. It highlights a data structure that is very useful for organizing the, the algorithm. Probably many of you saw this, if not all of you, this is the SOX crowd. Um, so uh, let's say that we want to compute a likelihood query. Uh, we have evidence. This is a Bayesian network. We have evidence and we want to go compute the posterior of A, given the, this evidence. So uh, this is the expression we want to compute. And it can be computed by organizing the summation operation, one variable at a time, along a particular order. So if the order is B first, C, and then so on, uh, we can uh, uh, start by summing over B, and we will pull all the functions that B is mentioned, put it in the first bucket, top bucket, and we can apply uh, this summation over the product and the rest of the functions are distributed uh, properly uh, into other buckets based on what they are defined over and we, are, we can now process each bucket at a time by this operation and uh, compute a function we call it a method and we place it in the appropriate bucket if that uh, mentions its variable so in this case in C and now we are doing the same computation, product and summing over C. This will generate a function. In this case, no products, we can continue. And we send message or functions from one bucket to the other. And at the end, in the, we get both the probability of evidence in this particular case, but also the conditional probability we, we sought for. Uh, and what you see in uh, the animation that I have here already, uh, uh, describing what is the complexity of this scheme. Uh, so the nice thing is that we can uh, predict the complexity by looking at the graph, the primal graph of the problem. Uh, if we organize it in the ordering that we are doing the computation, we can predict how many variables we will have to look at at each bucket, and the computation is exponential in this number of variables. And this is the parameter called induced width, and the complexity in this case, since we have uh, at most four variables in a bucket, it will be exponential in four or five, as I will elaborate more later. And that's the main algorithm. This is how you will solve the uh, summation query, the posterior um, probability, but also maximization. So if I want now, instead of computing the sum, to compute the, uh, the most likely assignment to all the variables given the evidence, I'll do the same thing. I will only replace the elimination operator of summation by maximization. And I compute functions. They have different meaning. They describe the best cost to go. That's one term that is common to use. And But everything else is identical. The structure, the complexity, it's the same. So it's all, uh, uh, many, algor many tasks of uh, uh, graphical models can be uh, solved this way. And the defining parameter that you, uh, I'm sure, know about is the induced width, also known as tree width. That uh, is, uh, for any variable ordering, we can uh, uh, compute the number, we can triangulate the graph. So we can go from last to first and connect the previous neighbors. And at the end, we can compute how many back arcs each node has. And the maximum is the induced width of that 
ordering. So for this ordering, the induced width is 4. For this ordering, the induced width is 2. And it's obvious that we wish to have the smallest one, but to get the smallest one is MP complete. Yet we can, we have many algorithms that are doing a good job in um, uh, getting a good uh, uh, induced width that are greedy, and this problem is well studied. And um, uh, the main thing is that we know what is the complexity of particular ordering uh, once we have the ordering. So let's see what is the uh, what would be uh, uh, how would we solve the marginal map in the case of uh, by by bucket elimination. So here is immediately you can see the hardness the added hardness of bucket uh, of um, the marginal map. Uh, when we want to compute the uh, max over some of the variables, in this case. Uh, the, uh, we want to maximize over these, these three variables and to sum over these variables, B and C. We have to first do the summation and then the maximization. Because there is no commuting the ordering between max and sum, there we are restricted in the available ordering that we have. Other than that, everything is the same. We will do summation on some variables and uh, optimization or maximization on max variables. And at the end, we will get the value, the optimal value that we wish to have. Uh, and we can see what would be the induced width that is along a restricted ordering. And clearly, uh, if we were not restricted, we would be able to have any, and had we being able to use any ordering, we would have a far better induced with a far better performance. In our restricted case, we are constrained to have worse performance, and this is one way of uh, understanding or illustrating the, the, the difficulty of marginal map. Yet, uh, unconstrained ordering can also provide a bound, and this was exploited in various algorithms uh, to solve the marginal map task, the, these earlier algorithms. So this was a, a taste of the main type of algorithms that you see in inference. In this case, I show you the exact algorithm. Obviously, they can be translated to, into approximation algorithm. We know about belief propagation and the joint graph propagation and all that. But they are trying to take the case of uh, uh, tractability of trees and move it to graphs. Still, the basic atomic um, operation is create generating message uh, functions and passing them around. So now let's go to search. So search in general, state-based search is just a tree where you move from one state. You have a transition. These state-based models um, or model based on states uh, normally are also called transition models. You describe in the model how you move from states to the next set of states. And this can be described in a tree of all the possible states. And we have initial states and goal states, etc. Well, how would it be for our graphical models or variable based? The, way the translation is obvious. We can have the tree of all the possible combination of configurations uh, along a particular variable ordering. And um, we can use it to compute anything. But this uh, is blind, this uh, uh, depiction of stage wave is blind to the structure of the graphical model and we would want to capture it. So if, if I have this set of table, this Markov networks, this is the gra its graph, the primal graph, we can associate it with a pseudo tree, a pseudo tree uh, the one here, that we capture problem decompositions. What we see here is that uh, this tree spent the graph, but all the arcs that are not on the tree are back arcs. We don't have arcs in the graph that go that course between branches. And this is important. Uh, it captures the fact that if we assign values to A and B, this is a problem. And this is a problem are independent. So we can capture this in an end or search tree. 
which is something that was already observed in the early days of AI in state-based graph, uh, state-based models. Uh, uh, in the following way, we can have, again, I mean, uh, we can, we will depict now in the description of the search space, both the variable names and their values. So or node, we will call or node uh, the variable names and they, they uh, will have their values as child node. And uh, in this case, you see that if we assign A and B both uh, values, then the problem decouples and we can have end nodes. And end nodes where we have to solve separately the subproblem rooted at C for this particular assignment and the subproblem rooted at E. And uh, we will have to do that for every assignment of A and B according to how the pseudo tree guides us. But this subtree is uh, captures all the possible configurations also, and it's far smaller. We can go even farther by uh, and exploit the structure of the graph even farther by using this something that is called context. So uh, context tells us, or very well tells us, uh, what the subtree below the, uh, the node depends on. So uh, with, without elaborating too much, you can see that I can recognize by looking at the graph at the, at the problem that actually many of the subtrees in the tree are the same and I can merge nodes. If I merge nodes in the all tree, I will get this graph. If I merge it in the end, or I will get this graph. And the merging is done by the context. Uh, if I see that, uh, for, in for instance, in this particular example that um, the context of F is A and E, namely the, the subtree below F doesn't depend on B at all, according to our graph, then I can merge for all the contexts that have the same assignments to A and E. And this make the, the, the end or search tree and end or search graph, we can, we can do all of that just by looking at the problem graph. And it's clear that any query should be better uh, answered or more fe effectively answered efficiently if we apply it to the end or context minimal graph. So this is a represent work that we did uh, since 2005, 6 and so on, developing the methodology and, uh, and that underlie that will underlie any task that we want to compute using search methods. Uh, overall, the state space search that we are engaged in is bounded by some graph parameters. So if we are doing the naive things, we are exponential in the number of variables, the k is the domain size. But if we are searching over endo tree, it's the height of the pseudo tree that matters. And if we search on the endo graph, uh, we are we will have back the induced width. So the size of this end or uh, a graph is exponential. Also, we can show that it's exponential in the induced width. Uh, however, when you search a tree, you can do it in linear memory, and this we can do over end or tree. When we are searching a graph, we need memory, which is also uh, exponential in the induced width. And I think I, I forgot to mention that all the bucket elimination methods that are exponential in the induced width the problem is that the the memory, namely they require exponential mem uh, memory exponential in the induced width, and this is what would limit their applicability. So we have the same kind of uh, notion in in the end or graph, but we in in searching we can mitigate it better. So once we have this now framework of search, we can answer on it all the queries that are of interest, inclu including the marginal map and, uh, and decision problems and so on. But let's see in more details how we are uh, able to continue and make it uh, a real representation. So what we are going to do is uh, from the tables, we, we can associate the arcs from all nodes to end node with costs. And uh, now we are not talking about the solution path, we are talking about end or we're talking about 
a, a solution tree. The cost of a solution tree is the product of the cost of the ax, and it corresponds to the cost of configuration in the original model that we are talking about. Um, if we now want to compute to answer any query, we have a task. Yeah, we, the, we capture the task by the notion of a value of a node. Uh, the value of a node is, in the case of belief updating, is the belief for the subproblem below the node. And we can compute the value, or if we are doing maximization, we'll do the optimal value below the node. And we can compute this uh, value by traversing the tree recursively when in end node we take the products of the end of the values of its child node, in O node we take we do summation. So there is a, a, a simple recursion that allows us to compute the value of interest from leaves to root. For all the tasks, here I show the, uh, the summation task. Uh, we can do it over the graph as well. Here I showed you the tree. But if I have, if I want to do my search over context minimal and or graph, that will be more efficient. But then we have to cache some of the results. So we will not explore a tree more than once. And we can cache based on the context. And uh, this is why memory, again, uh, the context is bounded by the induced width. We will cache and we need the, that memory in order to enhance the efficiency. So in this particular example, we show you how the computation is done to compute the probability of evidence when D is 1 and E is 0. We assign those values to the leaves, and bottom-up computation will give us the, um, the answer. So that's it. And uh, one more thing. Um, uh, we can have... Uh, we can. It's nice to think about uh, the context minimal and or graph uh, is facilitating in, uh, a perspective of search and variable elimination in one roof. If we look at this problem here with this primal graph and this pseudo tree for this problem with the context, this is the end of search graph that will be uh, generated. Variable elimination simply is computing functions going from leaf stool. So to illustrate this, I mean, you can see here the functions that I'm, it's as if we have functions going from the leaves to the root, and they will be illustrated both on the left and the side. We are just computing those functions layer by layer. That's how we can view that when we are uh, the variable elimination on this end or context minimal graph. While search will do the opposite, will go from the root to the leaves, and it can go in a variety of ways, uh, not by not, and doesn't have to do it function by function or layer by layer. But that's uh, give us a vivid um, a view of the relationship between the bucket elimination and end of search. And this is very much related to what uh, is common as some product networks or arithmetic circuits that can be compacted far farther. Uh, one more word is that we can have different pseudo trees. Here is two pseudo trees for this problem, and they will lead to different search trees. As as we the notion of ordering or finding the right pseudo tree definitely is important, and we are working on on we have some understanding of how to generate good uh, pseudo trees. So now to the marginal map. Uh, if we want to solve the marginal map with this search method, we will have again to respect the ordering of the variables. So. We have here an illustration. This is our primal graph. And these uh, are the maximization variables, the, the colored one, and the rest are the summation variables. And if this is the situation, uh, I can have the pseudo tree. The pseudo tree needs to start with the maximization variables. And we can then generate the pseudo, uh, uh, solve the problem on the, uh, uh, on the end of graph that correspond to the pseudo tree. When in this case, for the map variables, we will have maximization prob, uh, operation and for the sum problem, summation prob, uh, operation when we are computing the value going from leaves to root in, in whatever search method we select. However, if we uh, if the 
map variables were different, for instance, those variables here, we will be restricted and we will have to have a chain like pseudo tree, which doesn't give us much um, advantage uh, in our search scheme, and we will have to do the, the regular uh, exploration of the whole tree. So this is again illustrating the the the, the uh, complexity associated with the marginal map in the restriction of the ordering. So the, for the marginal map, the search space is a, a if it's a tree, it's a exponential in the height of the constraint. Uh, ordering and in the width if we are searching the graph in the induced width of the constraint ordering. Okay, so now we are at the next uh, uh, part where we will see how we can uh, relax uh, variable based inference methods to provide bounds and then we will talk how we can use them as heuristics. So again this is the picture that we saw before you have here um, the maximization task and the bucket elimination algorithm, but it, and uh, I didn't uh, talk about it before, but in the optimization case, we also want to generate, not only to find the optimal value, we want to generate a configuration. So this is very easy by consulting the messages, the functions that we generated, we can compute uh, greedily by consulting those functions, we can compute an assignment configuration that is guaranteed to be optimal. That's very well known, and we will return the optimal solution. But if we cannot do that because of memory, because the induce is too hard, we can now try a, an approximation. And the one I will show you is called mini bucket approximation. The idea is very simple. We take all, when we process a bucket, we have functions. This is the computation we want to apply, but it's hard. So we partition the bucket into mini buckets. We apply the computation in each mini bucket separately, and then we combine the, the two messages. And the nice thing is that we can show that this provides a relaxation, namely the, uh, the result is an upper bound in the case of maximization over what we wanted to compute. So it provides bound. And the complexity saving is obvious, it's exponential in the number of variables in each mini bucket rather than all the variables. How it looks when we are doing it, uh, we embed it in the bucket elimination? Very simple. Let's assume that we have some kind of an I bound that tells us we need no more than three variables in each message. So we will partition the first bucket and we will send instead of a single message, two messages. And from there on, things are the same, and at the bottom we get an upper bound. The meaning of, uh, these are the description of the messages, but the, the semantics of the operation that we are doing is as if we duplicate variables. The B here and the B here are different Bs, as we see here. So it's, we can see vividly the, the impact on the structure and the impact on the induced width. Uh, and now if we wish to generate a solution, we can just ignore the fact that we did relaxation and we can compute it in exactly the same way. And we will get something and, the, and since it's a, a, a solution, we can compute its cost and it will give us a lower bound. So we get by going with the messages top down, we get upper bound, going up, generating a solution, which is a lower bound, we get lower bound. And this gives us what we want this framework of any time because we can have a parameter now, the I bound, and we can decide what I bound to use. We can start from very good computation and get very uh, large uh, intervals, but as we increase the bound, we, uh, we will have a bit tighter and tighter bound. As I increase, we get both accuracy and complexity increase. The problem is that it's not fully any time because we will have to stop at some point because of memory. We normally cannot go beyond 20 and we get stuck. Uh, to overcome that, we improve further and we use what's known as tightening the bound or uh, variational method for cost shifting or bound decomposition, uh, which I will describe now. Uh, suppose you look at this graphical model and now just switch for a moment from product 
to summation and here is maximization. We, this is what we want to compute. Bucket elimination will simply shift the maximization inside and this will give us a bound. But this is very bad bound. What we can do in addition, we can shift some cost between these functions after we duplicate those variables. And this will be the picture. We shift costs from between neighboring uh, functions uh, 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 relative to common variables. We make sure that the total cost that we shift around is zero, so we don't change the global function. But when we are just, uh, when we are looking at the functions themselves, they are now modified and we can try to minim to tighten the bound based on this shifted cost and uh, get tighter and tighter bound on what we want to compute. Um, so this, uh, the question is now how to do the tightening and there are uh, many approaches and these ideas emerged in a variety of communities because dual decomposition, three-related DP in constraint uh, network community, they call it soft R consistency, maxim diffusion, and the optimization of this is done by, by gradient descent methods, the optimization, and they can lead to a variety of algorithms. In particular, we can have uh, a structure of a small subset of variables and shift cost in uh, iteratively uh, between uh, the, the clusters, or, and we can do it until we optimize the cost, but this can take some time. Or alternatively, we can just shift costs bucket by bucket in one iteration, compromising uh, 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 the bounds versus computation. Um, here I have an illustration of, for one, uh, for two particular instances, this is due to my colleague Alex Eiler. I forgot to say in the, uh, uh, the beginning that all this work is collaboration with many people, but in particular with my uh, student, uh, my past student, uh, Radu Marinescu, Junkyo Lee, and uh, Alex Eiler. So this um, uh, graph uh, uh, was made by Alex. This is illustrating the, the importance of this tightening. So, uh, on these two problem instances that come from the pedigree domain, uh, when the I bar, you can see here how the, how the uh, bound uh, improves, lower is better, uh, when we increase the I bound. Namely, I bound is how many variables we allow in a mini bucket. But when we do cost shifting only in a bucket, then we get a very uh, significant improvement. And if we do this iteratively, we get further improvement but again, with more time. Okay, so now how do we use it in a combination of search? The idea is as follows. We have, this is a search community, so I can get somewhat into the details. We have a search tree, and we want a heuristic when we compute an optimal solution, as we know, at some point when we get to a node, we want the heuristic that will predict uh, the, the quality of the subtree below it. What we can gain is by, by doing the mini bucket elimination and remembering the function that we are generating, we are creating bounds that we can tap into. So if we go into the details and compute what we seek to evaluate at a particular node, we can realize that actually this is captured, some of the information is captured by messages that are computed by the mini bucket. And we can do this mini bucket algorithm in pre-processing, keep the information and then consult these functions as we uh, perform search. Uh, some of the, we will have the G, which is will be part of the function and the, this will be the H. So that's basically the idea. Uh, and that's what I will show uh, in the continuation of the talk. Um, so uh, again, we uh, I, I would like to really consider what is going on with the marginal map. So the marginal map, uh, in addition to the fact that we are restricting in the variable ordering when we are generating the search tree, there is 
another thing to consider. If we are doing search, we can think about doing search over the optimization variables. And when we get to the tip of a knob, we have to compute a summation. Computing a summation by itself is a number p complete problem. So the, 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 in the regular optimization task, when we get to the leaf node, we, the, computing the co its cost is easy. Computing the cost of a leaf node over a math variable is already hard. So that's an illustration of why it is hard and the, uh, the things that we have to overcome. So if we want to look side by side at search for the case of marginal map, this problem, we exact methods can be either variable elimination. This is illustrated here from bottom to top or search from top to bottom. And the pseudo tree is the same pseudo tree for both methods. But if the functions are too large to, to perform uh, this uh, variable elimination, we can do the mini bucket elimination and its enhancement and compute it and then have the heuristic uh, con uh, provided to during search uh, to the search algorithm. So now we are in business. So we know how to formulate the problem and how to have heuristics and we have all the components that we need. All we need now is to look at the search community and harness all the knowledge that was acquired over the last 70 years and use it. And that's what we did. Uh, so uh, we can do the, uh, to solve the, to, sol to still solve the marginal problem, uh, map problem exactly, we can do depth first search or we can do best first search or we can do a combination. So at first we apply depth first search and best first search and uh, we realized uh, that uh, Best first search gave us better answer in general because it requires doing less of the summation problems. So uh, best first search is superior, it expands fewer full map nodes. We, we performed the search only on the optimization variables and we needed to get to apply less summation problems by the nature of best first search. So, and the, here are just illustration of um, we explored many of the variations that you can imagine and compared with none and all search schemes. This was our first uh, take at the problem and we immediately show that uh, all these blue uh, schemes correspond to our advanced methods over typically benchmarks that uh, comes from the UAI competitions, grids, pedigrees, promedias and others comparing a variety of algorithms including the state of the art at the time that we are based on unconstrained variable ordering. And we show that the current methods solve fairly many more instances exactly um, uh, within the, an hour or two hours time bound. But we had to move forward and we move forward to any time uh, methods. And here, um, uh, we again went to all the knowledge that we have in heuristic search, in particular weighted best for search. We looked to uh, where you, uh, this idea of inflating the heuristic and it gives us a well-known bound, uh, which is a fa factor by the heuristic. And, uh, we developed a variety of, uh, weighted and all best first and weighted recursive best first and so on that are based on methods developed in heuristic search. We trade, we, uh, experimented with them and explored their benefits. Um, we did restarts and so on. And also we, uh, developed some combination of depths best first and depth first search that interleave and interact because best first search give us upper bounds as it progresses. depth first search give us lower bound. It's natural to just interleave these ideas. It's done in many other areas. Uh, so, and the, the two uh, uh, particular versions of search that proved more successful uh, after some experimentation was where look ahead and all best for search and alternating and all best for search. I will quickly talk about those because these are the better algorithms. So look ahead and all best for search. So that's best for search, but 
going a search tree, but at certain points it makes dives, look ahead to find full solution and to update the lower bound, and there is some interaction between the two. And there is a parameter theta that, uh, 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 that control how often we are doing this depth dive uh, in the algorithm. So that's basically the, the look ahead. The alternating and or best for search, you just do both algorithms side by side and grow them in parallel, but you also uh, glean information from one to another, um, bounding the memory or uh, improving the heuristics and doing this in a, uh, in a sophisticated way, I uh, yielded this algorithm which turns out to be the best. Now, when we are talking about how to evaluate the algorithms, we have many benchmarks and we have competitions. Uh, in UAI, there are competitions uh, for optimization and recently marginal map. Uh, we normally do very well in those competitions. Uh, in a, uh, for We have these benchmarks and there are statistics for the marginal map, so you can see that the induced width can be very high for these uh, benchmarks. And just showing the results of some anytime algorithms. In this graph, uh, we have five or six algorithms, some of them weighted, some uh, weighted search, and some of them uh, alternating, uh, best, a combination of depths and best for search. The first, I mean, as this is a single instance from one benchmark. The left, the, the heuristic is with eyeball 12. Here it's 18. Let me highlight just one slide. Uh, so you can see here for both eyeball 12 and 18 that these red algorithms provide for each uh, for each algorithm we have two lines the upper bound and the lower bound and the time we what we have in the excess is the uh, low CPU time and here is the solution the actual solution uh, cost. And you can see how the lines converge with time, but it's clear that the red algorithms that are not weighted uh, overall were superior in our experiments. And this is another illustration of this. When we are averaging over the pedigree domain, we compute a gap, and these three algorithms, a weighted algorithm and these two alternating algorithm, and you can see as a function of time that uh, or which one is better. So this is just to illustrate the methodology of evaluation. So finally, uh, all these algorithms that I just showed you are as, uh, assuming that the summation subproblem is not that hard. We can compute it exactly. We have to move away from it because often we cannot do that, so we need to do sampling. Uh, we looked at importance sampling. In importance sampling, um, you want to compute expectations, yeah, but not always you can sample the probability distribution. So you sample from a proposal and you need to update uh, the function. And what is happening when you sample from Q instead of P, you, you compute the weights for each sample and the estimate is the average of over the weights when the sampling is from a proposal distribution. Very well known idea. And uh, if, if the Q functions will be uh, accurate, we, we will have uh, faster convergence. So here in sampling, we now bring also the, the idea of we replace sam uh, search with sampling, but we will use the heuristic, the weighted mini bucket heuristic or mini bucket heuristic that we described for a proposal. And this is a method, uh, a weighted mini packet important sampling was developed by uh, Lee Fisher and Eiler, very nice algorithm. Now, I didn't mention the notion of weights in weighted mini packet, but it's possible to improve the algorithm by associating weight and computing what is called holder in a power summation. I will not get into that here, but if we are doing the, way, the mini packet algorithm this way, then we can sample now, instead of compute, we can sample the one variable at a time from the functions that are generated. And when we get to a bucket that was partitioned, we will sample from a mixture. So the, the nice thing about this method is that the weight is bounded. The weight in the proposal is, would be shown to be bounded. And when you have this property, you can use 
Bernstein inequalities and other inequalities from the statistic to provide bounds on the answer. So if you compute, want to compute the partition function, this expression, and you did, so you have a particular bound and a, a particular number of in, uh, samples and confidence, you can compute this expression. And uh, this provides us with a way of replacing the summation with sampling, but with probabilistic bounds, upper and lower bounds. We and allow us to extend our methods further to the case when the uh, is when we cannot solve the summation exactly, and still provide bounds, even though those are now probabilistic bounds. So we extended both the, these two type of algorithm that we saw, and I will not get into the details. Uh, um, time is running out. Uh, to the best first and to the depths first, the two, these two look ahead, uh, depths first search that I presented, uh, a, look ahead AOBF and alternating AOBF. And the main thing is that when we compute lower bounds, we just, uh, uh, invoke this, uh, over the summation variables when we get to the terminal nodes, because the search is conducting only on the map variables when we get to summation variable we do the sampling we incorporated this in a particular fashion in both algorithm and this led to two type of algorithm one we call stochastic anytime search and then other uh, anytime look ahead dfs i will leave the details to later uh, and um, empirically there we observe very nice results on a variety of benchmarks here we, I show how we depicted the results because this is tricky uh, since often we don't have answers and the problems are too difficult. What we computed is the relative gap over for each instance when the baseline is either the exact solution or the best solution we have. And this is the relative accuracy and lower is better. This is for lower bounds and this is for upper bounds for each of the algorithms that we tested and uh, I will only want to impress that this new algorithm this uh, any stochastic best for search and any LDFS provided far better uh, overall performance in terms of lower bounds in terms of upper bounds we had a, another algorithm I'm not describing here that was superior to those algorithms and this was uh, for this is for grid problems we also work with planning instances. So I mentioned planning is one of the directions we are interested in and planning problems are very hard because you have to transfer state-based representation into graph-based, uh, variable-based representation and capture the horizon. It turns out to be hard. Uh, uh, these are, but yet we were able to have a good performance. These are block worlds example with a variety of difficulties and our new algorithm were far more uh, able to address this challenging planning task. We have software where we are uh, that you can get all the algorithms on my website. Uh, Merlin is the software developed by Raduma and Nesco. And uh, our future work is focusing on application that, like the computation, protein design, and on planning. Uh, influence diagram, planning under uncertainty, which are all mixed, queer, mixed queries. And I would like to finish with uh, presenting my group over the years. So these are uh, uh, all my students over the years, and they are all in one way or another part of this research. Uh, the main collaborator on what I was talking now is uh, Radu Marinesco, Alex Junkyuli, and Chi uh, Lu. And this is my new book. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions.